comments shall be addressed to the board of directors and limited to three minutes per speaker. The board of directors may choose to respond to comments or request staff to re respond at the conclusion of the public comment period. All right, with that, um, can we have a roll call, please, Tiffany? Board President Rosary. Here. Director Case. Here. Director Kilkenny. Here. Director Oyserman. Here. I don't see Director, Director Shea. Shea will be absent tonight. Thank you. You got it. All right, thank you, Tiffany. And then uh, moving on to adopting the agenda. Um, does the board have any questions or comments about the agenda? All right, uh, anything from the public about the agenda? Sure, one second. Stephen. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm wondering how these agendas are being created um, because each month uh, we uh, bring up items that we would like to discuss at future meetings and they never seem to get put on the agenda. Is Lisa uh, setting the agenda? Is Eric setting the agenda? Is it a consultation? And if it's a consultation, you know, why isn't stuff appearing? Um, we have issues concerning um, alcohol in the park. Um, uh, there's other items of, of interest and uh, it certainly seems like um, certain topics are just being avoided and, and uh, it's kind of frustrating. Um, we are a democracy and so I think uh, people's voices, your voices, our voices are important and um, the staff needs to listen to what is being expressed and make every effort to um, create an agenda that reflects the concerns of uh, the community. Thanks. All right, thank you, Stephen. Any other comments? Uh, no. All right. Then let's move on to approval of the consent calendar. Uh, do I have a motion? Okay. <laughs> I, I motion. I motion to approve the consent calendar as written. Do I have a second? I'll second. I mean, <laughs> right. uh, any comments from the board? None. We screwed up. We need to adopt the calendar and then talk about the consent calendar, right? Sorry. What? what? No, Never mind. I'm I didn't screw up. I didn't screw up. Okay. okay. I'll be quiet. Done, done, done. Everything is good. We're good. Um, okay. So any um, any comments, questions from the public on the consent calendar? Sure. One second. Stephen. Yes, um, you, you know, once again, we have the consent calendar. It's good to see the, uh, the bills that we're paying out, um, but for whatever reason, uh, we never see the revenues that come in. We've had a couple of events and I don't know how uh, you can uh, uh, evaluate the success, at least the financial success of any activity if you don't track revenues as well as expenses. Um, that's, that's all I have to say on that, thanks. All right, thank you, Stephen. Um, all right, well, can we put this to a vote then? Yeah. Sorry, right, I jumped the gun earlier. Okay. Right Board President Ruggieri. Aye. Director Case. Aye. Director Kilkenny. Aye. And Director Wiserman. Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Now moving on, public comment. Open time for items not on the agenda. One second, please. Stephen. We all set? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, How's everyone doing tonight uh, uh, with the time change? Uh, the time's changed, the season has changed, and our community is changing. Um, we are on the verge of a huge, huge change. Um, and I don't know if any of you have been following what's going on with uh, the housing, the affordable housing that uh, may be coming into our community. Um, currently, the way it looks, uh, there are a thousand uh, units of low and very low income housing coming in at various sites in the valley. Um, however, with uh, the special provisions, it could be as much as 2,000 um, uh, or maybe even more, which effectively will. Uh, uh, it will effectively double the size of our community um, with low-income housing. Um, obviously, this is going to have a huge impact on our schools, on our community, uh, everything. And um, I, I think it's wise for you as leaders to acknowledge the changes that are coming forth um, and also consider the fact that you are leaders for our community. So you set the tone and the agenda uh, for the future. Um, there's a lot of things to discuss uh, about the future of our community. One such topic is alcohol in our parks and uh, uh, how we manage open space and what we do as far as improvements in the park, as far as bathrooms and trail maintenance and building a new trail. There's all kinds of things. Um, we're a new generation. Um, this is like the second or maybe third generation of Marinwood residents. The first generation did a whole lot. They were leaders. They were uh, committed to the community. They built the, uh, the fire department, the rec department. Um, they built, they, they purchased the open space. And now's the time for big ideas and to look forward. Um, I'm very frustrated with some of the stuff that's going on now. It seems like a lot of waste of time, but there's a lot of anger uh, in the community regarding um, uh, issues around alcohol use in the park. And I hope we can all keep proper perspective that we're not simply serving our friends. We're serving the community for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Any other public comment? Uh, I have no other hands raised, thank you. Can I make a quick statement? To my understanding, the Marinwood CSC Board of Directors has nothing to do with anything regarding housing. We are here to serve the people who are living in the homes, but we have no say on what kind, where homes are built and what socioeconomic group that they are being built for. Correct, Eric? Um, Yes, that is correct. You certainly have a voice on what the impact may be. I actually had a conversation with our supervisor elect about this not very long ago, probably in the past couple of few weeks. Uh, and just because they have identified places where housing can go doesn't mean that housing will be built there. There's no applications in, there's nothing like that that's moving forward at this time. Anything like that would still have to go through some level of an impact in the IR study. 
correct, but as a board, we don't get to make any decisions. Uh, no, we you can don't have a decision voice, We can voice things right. as individual members of the community, just like the rest of the community. But as our board, we, do, we, do have, we don't have any. So we, there's no reason for our board to discuss these things until they actually come to fruition because we don't have any power over them, correct? You, you would discuss how it would impact district operations. So uh, that would be that. You know, what would be the impact to fire service? Would we be able to adequately serve X number of residents given our current fire status? What would be the impact to our parks or things along those lines? And so we will discuss those things if and when housing comes. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, there, there, there will be. There will probably be more to discuss as, as time goes on. I mean, this is certainly not a new. Um, a new content. It's not something that's new to our community, and, and there will definitely be more to discuss as time goes on. But thanks for clarifying that piece of mind. Can I just add? I don't think he was telling us to discuss it right now, but I think he was just saying to be aware of it that it's in the process of our community right now and the effect of it. So I think we all are. But thank you, Kevin. I, I, all right. So then, um, all right. So any, um, so let's let's move on to district matters. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to uh, bring over Deputy Fire Chief Bob Sinnott, um, who is going to speak to the first item. If you want to go ahead and introduce it. Great. Hi, Chief. Are you there? Hey, we are. Everybody. Good evening, Hi. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, really quick introduction. Um, Chief Senator serves as the Deputy Fire Chief for Center Fowl. He's also the Fire Prevention Officer and covers that for our area as well. Um, he, at one time, uh, between um, former Fire Chief Chris Ray and current Fire Chief Darren White, served as the interim Fire Chief for the City of Center Fowl, which uh, gave him the joy and the privilege of coming to our in person meetings once a month for uh, about a half a year there, I would say. So, uh, Chief Senator is no stranger around here. We respect him and uh, appreciate him. I miss him. him. Thank you. That's very nice. Nice to see you all. Yeah, he's, he's very in tune with what's happening in Marinwood, is my point. So, uh, Eric, I, I do have that PowerPoint presentation. I was wondering if, if you want to load it and I'll tell you when to advance the slides. Or uh, if you want to share screen. your screen and do it yourself, that would probably work uh, easiest, Chief. Let's see if I can pull that off here. If you can't, I'm happy to pull it up. Ah, there you go. Okay, are you seeing that? Yes. All right, great, thank you. Uh, good evening, board members. On behalf of Fire Chief Aaron White, tonight we are asking you to consider adoption of Ordinance 2022-01, the California Fire Code 22 edition and related documents. This is the regular triannual update that occurs along with the package of building codes that will be formally adopted by the County Board of Supervisors in the next few weeks. Together, these make up the building and fire codes used in the Marinwood Community Services District. The adoption process begins with the publishing of the International Fire Code, or ISC for short, which is published by the International Code Council every three years. The California Fire Code is, is an amended version of the International Fire Code. Each cycle, the California Fire Code follows one year later to enable the review and amendment process to occur. This is similar to the California Building Code documents as well. With each three-year cycle, and led by the California State Fire Marshal's Office, the ISC goes through an extensive and collaborative review process with multiple stakeholders in order to create the California Fire Code. The ISC is amended to reflect the hazards, threats, and conditions unique to the state of California. Prior to the cycle becoming law, local jurisdictions have the authority to further amend the California Fire Code based on climatic, geological, and topographical conditions. And this is just a short list of the groups that are involved in reviewing the ISC in order to make the California Fire Code. Regardless of your actions, the, 20, the 2022 edition of the California Fire Code becomes the law of the land on January 1, 2023. It's known as the minimum code, just like the California Building Code, California Residential Code, and the other 12 parts of Title 24 California Code of Regulations. However, Existing local amendments do not carry forward without the board approving the new ordinance. The fire code works in tandem with building codes. While building codes control and integrate fire safe design into the construction of new buildings, fire codes dictate fire prevention and life safety on an ongoing basis beyond the period of initial design and construction. Fire codes also regulate activities and processes that occur in buildings, as well as the safe storage, handling, and the processing of hazardous products and flammable and combustible materials. Lastly, fire codes define fire and life safety hazards both within and around buildings and establish standards for emergency vehicle access and water supply for fighting fires. Each cycle, marine fire agencies include Appendix A of this document into the ordinance approval process. Appendices are often very useful. We formally identify several appendices of the California Fire Code in the adoption process. Because it's primarily building-based, the fire code contains very little pertaining to WUI. Thus, Appendix A from the IWUIC provides additional enforcement capability. At the local level, members of the Marine County Fire Prevention Officers Association have met over the past several months to conduct an extensive page turning process. The objectives of this effort were to become familiar with the new code, to determine if any new local amendments are needed, and to create a model ordinance for all elected bodies in Marin to independently consider. In order to promote countywide consistency, the goal is for all marine fire departments to utilize the same code language. I'm pleased to note this has been a practice for the past several code cycles. The ordinance before this evening really contains no new amendments. Layout of the ordinance, references, section numbers, dates, and definitions often need updating throughout the code cycles. In review, the ICC updates the ICC every three years. That happened in 2021. The state amends and adopts the following year. That's the California Fire Code in 2022. Regardless of local action, the California Fire Code 2022 edition becomes law on January 1st, 2023. But as mentioned, local agencies have the authority to create local amendments. In Marin, all fire agencies work together to create uniform amendments as needed. The new ordinance must be adopted locally 30 days prior to January 1, 2023 for the local amendments to carry forward. For the existing amendments to remain active without interruption, it is essential that the board approve the ordinance 30 days prior to the January 1, 2023 implementation of the 2022 California Fire Code. Staff also needs to submit a signed copy of our ordinance to the County Fire Marshal to be part of a package of district ordinances approved by the County Board of Supervisors at the November 15th meeting. Thus, staff tonight recommends adoption of, ordinance of the ordinance. I'm pleased to report that the Santa Fe City Council passed the 2022 Fire Code ordinance last evening. And that concludes my report. Eric, you're muted. Thank you. I am uh, not sure if the board has any questions right now. You're simply in the public hearing section of this. So there's, we're not doing a motion or a vote or anything yet. This is uh, simply for comment uh, uh, and questions. Hello, everybody. Today I'm pleased to present you this. Okay. I have none. 
Okay. Uh, Thank you, Chief. Lisa, whenever you are ready for. Uh, Okay, that means we, so, okay, so we do public comment for yes. one and two? Okay. No, just for one. This is part of the public hearing. Two, after you take in public comment, then you'll just make a motion and a uh, vote to approve. Or oh, whatever, okay, a motion and a vote. Yeah. Awesome, yeah but it's just, it's silly when they, you know, on ordinance things like this, you need to have a public hearing. It's the same way that this was introduced last month as part of the consent calendar. Is also, okay. um, it was also noticed in um, legal ads in the IJ as well. Got it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for the guidance. I have not ever conducted a hearing before, so it's <laughs> We don't do a lot of this around here. <laughs> um, all right. So then, uh, is there any anything from the public then? Any yeah. questions? One second, please. Stephen. Yes. Um, hi. I, someone's talking to me in the other room. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, I wanted to f find out if um, uh, why uh, the fire department is arresting people I, uh, um, in this uh, uh, in this code. And I guess I understand why you would be writing tickets. But um, when it comes to you know cuffing people and bringing them off to jail, that seems to me to be the role of the sheriff for uh, another for agency. And uh, maybe you could explain that to me. Hello. Okay. Is that, a that, that that's all I have for right now? Right. I, 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 it's it's this is a very powerful uh, document, and I, I just I, I think I, I actually I'm surprised that we would have authority to approve this because this is really a legal document, and all we're doing is contracting for uh, fire services, not uh, trying to you know restructure things in our community. So I'm just it's pretty heavy duty. That's that's all I'm saying. Chief, why do you need to arrest people? Okay. Um. Let's. Anything else, Stephen, from your comment? No, that, that's all I, I have. Right, so let's let's take public comment. Um, okay. Right, thank you. Any any anyone else have a comment from the public? Uh, no, there is not any other comments from the public uh, at this time. Okay. So, um, Chief, would you like to address the public's question? Any ordinance like this needs to contain enforcement power. If in the extremely unlikely event, an arrest were ever necessary, uh, that would have to be for something terribly extreme, the manufacture of fireworks in a residence, something of that extraordinary nature, we would certainly uh, utilize law enforcement. Fire department has no arrest powers. Thanks, Chief. Appreciate that. All right, then. Um, so. And then Lisa, if I could jump in, I mean, just to clarify too, um, Marinwood as the, you know, the fire jurisdiction in this area, we are the fire authority in this area, hence why Marinwood needs to adopt this document. Uh, this happens every three years. And as Chief mentioned in his presentation, there is a, there are no changes outside of some code changes that come from the state within this document that was last approved three years ago. Meaning that the authority that Stephen was alluding to and that Chief Fall, Senate falls under your governing falls body power. Under our governing body, but it isn't something that we're giving new. This was already there, correct? We, we, yeah, okay. we did this exact same thing three years ago. just wanted to confirm that that's what I remembered and that this isn't a difference. Okay. No. In fact, Chief Senate was the lead behind this three years ago as well. I remember that. All right, uh, can I make a motion to approve? You may. Yep. Order 2022-01. Second. Thank you. All right, I think we are set for a vote. Board President Ruggieri? Aye. Director Pace? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Oysterman? Aye. Thanks. Thank you. Um, um, before we move on, Lisa, if you don't mind, Chief, I'm not sure if you're going to stick around the meeting uh, for a little while. If you are, we'll go ahead and just keep you in the group here with us. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to shut off your camera. I'll uh, be uh, giving the, the uh, Chief's report later on in the meeting. Lovely. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sorry, Lisa. Oh, no, no, not at all. Thank you for um, offering the option to, for Chief to stick around. <laughs> um, all right. So then moving on to item three, fiscal year 2022-2023, quarter profit and loss budget to actual financial statement and variance report. Sure. I uh, included a, a fairly detailed staff report. Um, obviously, all the financial documents for quarter one are there in front of you, which uh, shows all recorded revenue and expenditures made throughout the first three months of the fiscal year. Uh, at the end of the financial statements, there's also a table um, noting any kind of variance or items of note um, of significance uh, that are in there, just trying to anticipate what some questions may be. Um, as you look through, you know, just even in my staff report, again, I, I know I kind of say this every quarter we do these, but, uh, you know, due to the nature of our business, especially from a uh, revenue standpoint, as well as an expenditure standpoint, simply because we've reached the 25% uh, mark of the year does not represent that we should be at 25% of our revenue and expenditures for the year. Um, we have seasonal and cyclical. We also have a lot of lump sum payments that we pay at the very beginning of every year. Um, so those are all reflected into here. <clears throat> Uh, as expected, you know, as you start to look at this, uh, again, you know, the primary cost drivers are the same as they are every time, staff wages, benefits, um, and in Q1, especially the advanced annual insurance payments and our um, lump sum pension uh, UAL payment that we make every year. Uh, so those just kind of look unusually large uh, in regards to the UAL payment for pension. Yes, it was large, um, approximately $500,000, but paying it upfront uh, as opposed to monthly with interest actually saves the district about $17,200 this fiscal year. Um, I also tried to give you guys just a little bit of a breakdown a reminder on what some of the upcoming capital project plans and uh, budget expenditures are for the coming fiscal year, obviously, in terms of the budgeted items, the playground play structure, uh, which may or may not be completed by the end of uh, of this fiscal year is a large one, you know, budgeted at a little over 220,000. Of course, um, almost 178,000 of that will be uh, paid for through grant funding received from the state. Um, and then I also tried to give you all an update on um, spending for the maintenance facility uh, courtyard construction project that was approved last June or possibly July, um, but really just got started this with this fiscal year. Um, and then just kind of give you guys a balance sheet perspective, which is not represented on here. Um, as of October 31st, 2022, the cash balance in the district's general fund uh, was stated at approximately $4.65 million uh, included in that. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's just under $100,000 in uh, restricted funds that represent our uh, Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority funding allocations. Um, and that can only be spent for authorized purposes under that JPA. And uh, that leaves our unrestricted at about $4.55 million, which actually is about a $1.2 million increase in general fund uh, cash balance over this time of year, uh, this, this point in time last fiscal year. Uh, our district OPEB trust fund currently has a balance as of quarter end of $466,062. 
And then, of course, of the 4.55 million stated above, 500,000 of that is designated as board designated reserves. Um, that is in our general fund. It's not in a separate investment account or anything. So I just want to point that out. Um, and that's from putting uh, allocating $100,000 at the end of each fiscal year for the last five years with plans to do another 100000 at the end of this year. So again, those are just simply board designated reserves, meaning uh, to defend that basically takes an action of the board. Um, and then finally, looking forward to Q2, um, you know, about mid-December uh, or later, uh, but usually prior to December 31st, we'll receive approximately 55% of our annual property tax and special assessment revenues. Um, those will be transferred directly into our, our treasury fund by the county. And then uh, kind of looking at everything in closing, uh, you know, I, I staff are quite pleased with the Q1 financial performance. Uh, we don't have any significant concerns. Everything fell in line largely in the way we expected it to. Um, yet we will continue to be diligent in our planning and oversight uh, of the actual performance of these items. Any questions? That was very concise, Eric. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. I don't really have a question. I just want to appreciate you and your staff for the amount of detail you're able to provide us um, to just kind of keep us in tune and in check with what's going on financially for the district. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you. Continuing to toot you guys as one. It's very great. It's extremely detailed. So anticipating questions that we're going to have. So I appreciate that. So we don't even have to call you because the answers are in the packet. Um, I guess one kind of big picture item is how are we feeling as we're coming back from all the closures? Are we feeling like we're rebounding in approximately back to what we were doing for camps and youth activities, et cetera? pre-COVID or are we exceeding it and how do we kind of see things moving forward? Um, from a rec standpoint, I'd let Luke go ahead and comment on that if he wants, okay. if you don't mind, Luke. Oh, no, uh, great. Um, yeah, uh, Savannah, actually, so I was planning on uh, originally putting the summer financial report on our camps and pool seasons in my report this for uh, this meeting and I completely didn't do that. After I said, so I um, had all that information ready, but I'll definitely put it in for the next uh, board meeting for next month and explain, you know, how everything I to give you guys a copy of the um, the, the page of all the, all the revenue expenditures for that. Okay. But I'm um, just to let you know that uh, this year's um, our summer camps and our pool programs all are um, completely on trend for pre-COVID, um, you know, trajectory through, you know, what we're doing 2018, 2019. And I'll be able to show that to you guys um, the next meeting, uh, just that we're, you know, you see a big change when we have to limit everything during um, the COVID with all the limitations on our, how many people can be together and all our programs had to be a lot right. smaller and worked a little differently. But um, this year was a return to normal and you do see that reflected in, um, you know, the performance and the revenue and everything. So. Perfect. Yeah. No, I know that we did a great job with the pause and not making sure that we're spending money that we didn't have. And then I just, I'm really happy to see the rebound as it has been. So thank you for everybody's super hard work and getting us through COVID and getting us smooth sailing as things opened up. All right. Um, anything else from the board? All right. Anything from the public? Um, yeah. One second, please. Steven. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, First of all, uh, Eric, once again, thank you so much for you know putting together these reports. It does give us a much better picture than we've had in the past. But um, I'm going to make uh, a statement I've made uh, before in the past. I, I actually think this is a very incomplete view of what's going on in the district. And why do I say that? Because our revenue sources are really from two areas. One, our taxes, um, which keeps uh, increasing, uh, hopefully, um, and that's a good thing. And then the other is our business, which uh, is flexible. And uh, we really don't have a very clear understanding of the business. And case in point, um, we look at the, uh, the Halloween Harvest Festival. Uh, we see all the expenses. Uh, we don't really understand the revenues, detailed revenues. And so when um, decisions are being made to invest in, in various uh, programs, we really don't know where we stand. And um, uh, we don't know where we can cut expenses and increase revenues. And I, honestly, I think it's, it's, um, there needs to be a different type of uh, reporting uh, for our business activities. So that's it. Um, in general, uh, we're moving in the right direction. And that's thanks to Eric's good efforts. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Um, any, anything else from the public? Uh, I do not have any hands raised at this time. Okay. Very good. All right, then let's move on to resolution 2022-17, fixing the employer contribution for employees and, and, and new attendance under the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Act. Yeah, this is an annual item that comes before the board every November. Um, as you are aware, we contract through um, CalPERS for our medical health. It actually falls under what's known as the Public Employee Medical Health Care Act, uh, more commonly referred to as PEMCA. Um, every year, they adjust their rates uh, effective for uh, at the beginning of the calendar year with January this year. Um, rates as uh, well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, the district has a longstanding policy that we contribute set percentages of the Kaiser premium for our region. Um, this year, the Kaiser premium through uh, CalPERS and PEMCA is increasing by 6.6%. So that changes the amount of the employer contribution towards these, hence the need and requirement for this resolution, which then gets submitted to CalPERS to make it official. Um, I will say that this has been planned, this has been budgeted, and this falls within the budgeted amount that is included for this fiscal year already. Um, so this is not an impact uh, to the budget in any way, shape, or form. Um, it was again planned. I mean, it is an impact, but it was a planned impact. So it is reflected in the budgeting totals for uh, medical health for the year. Um, the board is required to approve and submit. And again, this is just a formulaic and a uh, ministerial action that is required every year with the change. Rates. All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, all right. Well, is there a motion? I motion to approve resolution 2022 17 employee health care premiums employee contribution increase. Do we have to ask for public comment before we do you that? You can do a motion in a second, but you need to get public comment. You get public vote. comment after that. Gotcha. Sorry. I'll, I'll, right, right, I'll second that. All right. Any comments or questions from the board? None. All right. Public? Yeah, one second, please. Stephen. Oh, I didn't realize I raised my hand. I actually don't have any comments. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Anyone else? I don't see any hands on the panel here. Oh, so I think we're set to put this to vote. Board President Ruggieri? Aye. Director Case? Aye. Director Kilkenny? Aye. Director Razorman? Aye. Thanks. Passes, thank you. And 
that leads us to item five, the district manager report. Uh, yeah, a few items here. Um, again, I you know, try to give you guys stuff in writing uh, as much as I can, so I don't want to rehash a lot of this. I will just say, you know, on the maintenance facility, as I wrote in the very first line, it is basically all but uh, finished from the contract standpoint of it in the courtyards. Uh, right now, we are simply waiting for the installation of the gates, uh, which uh, is a little bit reliant upon a third-party subcontractor, which is actually the only subcontractor for the entire courtyard aspect of this project, um, which has been very nice. And uh, as soon as they get those in, we'll be able to call in for building inspection, and we'll also be able to call in for the DPW land use inspection, uh, which I do not anticipate any level of uh, concern with having those signed off, and we will be able to move in. Uh, I did put in here, we do still have um, two other items needed to fulfill to close out the permit, uh, and this involves one of the neighboring properties right behind the facility. We uh, are required to add some lattice work to the top of her fence, uh, as well as putting in a couple of trees between the facility and uh, her property line as well. This is meant to kind of serve as a screening uh, between her property, you know, from a, a view line screening from her property uh, to where the maintenance facility is. I actually did meet with the property owner uh, on Friday afternoon uh, after I had written this. Um, they are moving forward with the uh, latticing, and we're still discussing um, some of the other stuff on the trees, um, but it was a good meeting and it went well. Uh, I'm going to jump back to the fire department recruitment needs here in a second, um, just to touch on a couple of uh, items of note uh, quickly. Uh, I am meeting uh, with some uh, volunteers as well as Captain Papanikolaou from the fire department to kind of uh, uh, discuss if uh, and some of the representatives from the North Pole to discuss if a Santa tour um, with fire engines is uh, going to be possible this year. So there'll be some information on that um, coming up in the near future. Um, and then one uh, thing I just want to point out: the district recently received the president's special acknowledgement award from our insurance carrier uh, because we have not filed or had any paid claims for our property and liability insurance for the past five years. This actually results in a fairly decent uh, reduction in our insurance rates. And uh, yesterday I got a letter that, uh, well, I admittedly didn't even realize this, but for uh, fiscal year 21-22 we had no new claims for workers' comp, um, which is going to be great. Which is also going to not only reduce our experience modification factor, but also um, triggers an automatic uh, uh, discount in our worker comp as well, or uh, I guess kind of a refund is a better way to look at it. Um, so those are two great things on the insurance front. And then I just wanted to kind of bring the note on our fire department. Um, we do have some fire department recruitment needs um, and they're starting to get um, fairly significant. Uh, we have a current vacant position that was actually um, a firefighter who was on a long-term industrial injury leave that has resolved and that firefighter um, is no longer employed here. Uh, so that created a vacancy. And then we have a second firefighter paramedic. Both of these are firefighter paramedics. Um, who will be transitioning out of our department. Uh, it was kind of far away and working for a different department. And so that person is going to be leaving around the end of the year. So I've been working with Chief White as well as the HR team at Santa Fe, uh, putting out recruitment uh, notices and things like that. We'll set up a uh, uh, people to review the qualified applicants and interview panels. Um, I do want to put in there, and I know that this is in Chief White's report, so I'll leave uh, Chief Senate to talk a little bit more about this. Um, just the whole state and nature of firefighter paramedic recruiting uh, has become much, much more competitive than you re might remember. I mean, the days of uh, long lines of people applying for every job really aren't there anymore. Um, and you have a lot of fire departments with a lot of vacancies that they are trying to fill. We are a smaller agency. It's going to be a challenge because, quite frankly, we can't uh, offer some of the compensation packages that these larger departments can fill, but we're going to give it our best shot. Um and we will see what happens. Um, firefighter paramedic is you know, one of the highest in demand, I think, positions that people are trying to fill at station. They see Chief Senate nodding his head. Um, and you know, it was only about four or five, maybe five years now that we've been rolling with firefighter paramedics. We always had tailboard EMT firefighters um, on board, which is the same classification as our engineers and our and our uh, Captain. So uh, while we will certainly give it our best shot, I do recognize that we are at a disadvantage, a competitive disadvantage with this. Um, hopefully we get some qualified applicants and uh, we'll just have to kind of take it from there and see what we can do to fill this role. All right, thank you, Eric. Mm -hmm. Anything from the board? I just am definitely not trying to open up a big conversation here, um, but I just um, start to wonder, do you see this, Eric, potentially as being, I'm talking about the firefighter piece, uh, a potential first domino to us needing to think about our firefighting in general? I mean, I, you know, partnering- uh, with... I, think that, I think that domino fell a long, long time ago, Chris, okay. and we're several dominoes down the line on that. Okay. There has been a lot of discussions about the future of the fire department. Uh, I've actually recently sat down again and met with uh, the LAFCO executive officer. We've had um, some very good partnerships with Sandra Fell, you know, when we, especially, right. uh, they go back many years, but even more so integrated, you know, when Chief Roach retired and we decided to eliminate that position and move into a chief officer agreement with Sandra Fell, which I think from an operational standpoint was um, very beneficial to the district. Um, Again, I don't really want to get ahead of myself, uh, but I do think, you know, as a small district like ours, what could potentially come down the line is, you know, depending on how this round of recruitment goes, that uh, rather than recruiting for firefighter paramedics, it might be more of looking for tailboard firefighters. Um, Santa Fe technically is the fire is the paramedic authority. Uh, they have the ambulances. While it's nice when we are an ALS engine company and they can start to deploy paramedic skills while we wait for the ambulance, we are still not of the ability to transport. Um, we rely upon Santa Fe for all of that. Um, so it's again, I don't I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. I want to go through this recruitment process. I want to see what type of uh, qualified candidates we can hopefully get. Hopefully, it's not a, an issue. But if it becomes a challenge to fill these positions. Um, then yeah, it's gonna be a larger conversation down the line in terms of uh, staffing and qual what, what qualifications we're looking for for staffing. Cool, thank you, Eric, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm just trying to then keep our eyes open and, and keep our, our minds open to what's possibly coming down the road. Yeah, and again, I know that Chief White included um, some of this in his report, that obviously, but I mean, Chief Senator, if you have anything that you would, not to put you on the spot in any way, shape or form, but if you have anything to add or uh, uh, feel free, please. Well, Eric, I think you, you covered it well. Um, there are actually two challenges that um, are upon us now that I never anticipated seeing in my 42 year career now in the fire service. One is hiring. As Eric mentioned, we used to have long lines that would wrap around the fire station for people just to get an application, an opportunity to apply. That's long gone. Um, now we have agencies offering $10,000 sign-on bonuses for firefighters. That's something I've never seen before in my career. Um, that's what we're facing right now. So it's not just in Ringwood. It's, it's everybody, to be honest with you. It used to be there were several thousand new paramedics in the state annually. That number is down to now a few hundred. Um, it's just not a career path of desire like it, it used to be. Uh, something else that compounds the problem is the fact that the homegrown local firefighter is long gone, meaning grew up in the town that you now become a firefighter in. That's just not, that's just not the case anymore. Um, firefighters now live a significant distance away because they can't afford to live here. They want to own a home, they want to raise a family. They can't live in Marin County and do that. So they're living in Sonoma
make, makes a lot of sense as a teacher. We're facing the same things. There's actually that's a, a pretty good analogy. Different lines of work, but it's the exact same situation. Yeah, totally. we're, we're not. We're just not finding the interest levels. Um, used to be people wanted to be firefighters. They, you know, they, they were seeking that profession. They wanted it more than anything. And the last couple of recruitment academies we had, we actually had candidates in the academy who were like on the fence whether they wanted to continue or not. You know, I'm not sure this is the career for me. I might want to go do something else. That's something I've never seen before. Yeah. All right. Thanks for meeting us. Appreciate it. I have one question, and again, I don't want to open any cans, but is there any chance, or is it dead, is the volunteer firefighters? Uh, kind of still a different program. I mean, our volunteer program hasn't really run since uh, the pandemic started, you know, back in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. But even with that, you're still looking at, you know, quality. most of the people, especially through ours, um, they, they didn't meet the qualifications to even submit an application um, for the most part. I mean, we have had good success through that in the past, but I think that this was also a lot to um, Chief White's, or I'm sorry, Chief Senate's point, of, uh, you know, the interest isn't there. You know, I mean, even prior to the pandemic, we were, you know, we would have, you know, 30, 40 applicants for our program to take in 20 max. And, you know, towards the end there, we were lucky to have five to seven, 10 in the, in the volunteer program. So it was, uh, and these were people who, you know, kind of like what Chief White was saying was, hey, maybe this is something I want to get interested in. Or we would have people who liked the idea of being involved in a volunteer program, but actually had no desire to make this a career. This was something that they felt that they could um, do. You know, I don't, hobby isn't the right word, but a way that they could also help to contribute to, you know, communities through that avenue, but weren't necessarily looking to become professionals. Okay. That makes sense. Like us serving on the board. We're not going to become professional politicians. We're here to serve the community. Thanks. And I won't run into a birdie clean, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the point of me putting this report is, uh, you know, typically just because we're doing some hiring, I wouldn't necessarily put this in there, but I would be lying if I said it wasn't some level of a concern, and I'll be kind of anxiously awaiting to see how these kind of recruitment notices and drives go. And, uh, you know, I think if we, we have to start looking at what are we, you know, it doesn't make sense for us to be serving as an ALS engine company, giving our resources and staffing availability, and uh, pairing that with, is that really providing a, uh, what is the level of benefit it is providing to the community and kind of looking at some of the raw stats and data. But I, I don't want to go there yet. I, you know, I'd like to try to stay optimistic to say maybe uh, we can get some qualified applicants. Uh, we've had pretty good luck in the past. Um, uh, although, you know, when you get kind of people who are just kind of starting their careers, you know, much the Chief White or Chief Senate's point, well, I'm going to stop doing that, Chief, I promise. Is uh, you know they come in. With, it's hard for us to compete either with a, a more local agency to where they might be leave, living, or some of these larger agencies that simply provide much greater opportunity for advancement um, as well. Especially considering you know our three captains haven't been captains for an extraordinarily long amount of time. They're not necessarily close to or looking at retirement ages. It's just if people aren't leaving, there's no room for advancement as opposed to larger agencies where there's just many more people, many more stations, many more opportunities. Thank you, um, both Eric and Chief for putting it together. It's concerning and I look forward to hearing how it's going and having the discussions we are going to have to have well, as that goes on. Yeah, but, I think to Chris's point too, Savon, and everybody is, this is unique to fire. Yeah. You know, every employer is having a hard time filling jobs. They're, yeah. you know, they're, it's just the labor market, you know, you look at unemployment rates are so incredibly low. Well, a lot of that's reflected because when they measure unemployment is how many people don't have a job and are currently looking. Um, there's a lot, it's just, it's hard. I mean, we experience it on the rec side, on the lifeguard side, you know, this is in all industries. Um, it's just, it's an odd, odd time right now in that uh, there is a labor shortage. Yeah. Um, not to move away from this important thing, I did want to say thank you for the update on the maintenance facility and for everybody's hard work. I did a walkthrough today, made my husband go for a walk in the rain, and uh, it looks really good. I really like the pathways and the little spot for seating, and I look forward to seeing where the planting are, and I peeked in, so the fences look really nice, even tarped. Um, so I look forward to having those gates installed and having that go through and having Marco Estran and these are being able to move their stuff in and having that area kind of cleared out. I, I appreciate that, Savan. I, I, I would say you don't look forward to it nearly as much as Luke or I, who don't look forward to it <laughs> nearly as much as Marco, Estevan or Caesar are. Um, and you know, to, just to be very clear, you know, there's still going to be some level of an evolutionary process here as we continue to kind of landscape yeah. out and get that area in. But the pathway, in my opinion, I think does look great. Thank you to Luke, who um, put in a lot of time and effort into you know, really thinking about this and, and laying it out. I think we're these, you know, we'll have a couple picnic tables in that area. And as we get some of the plantings in front of the building and around the courtyards, it's just it's really going to look nice. So thank you. It looks, it looks really nice, even as a construction site. It, it's going to so. present a, a much more park like atmosphere than it's ever existed there in yes. the last 50 years. So it'll be very nice. I had one question just to follow up on the maintenance shed or the, the maintenance facility. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, the timing of it, do they have to wait until the fence is stained and completely done before they can either start moving some stuff in or the the grounds and the planting and all that other stuff too? No. As soon as we get sign off from the building department from a DPW land use, um, then we will start moving in and that'll become an operational facility. Those other things are kind of window dressing. Building department doesn't care if we stain the fence and they don't care what kind of plants we put in front of the building. And will they have say in what plants? Like, do they get to plan, or you all five of you get to plan together? Uh, we've had all sorts of conversations about it. And we've brought in uh, some, uh, one of our uh, parking recruits, an arborist, and uh, you know, city uh, park manager. So there's been a lot of consultation on what exactly it is that's going to go in there um, that makes the most sense. But yes, they will certainly have a large and have had a lot of it. In fact, all three park guys were very involved just in the layout of the path and the material and uh, the, the, the items and everything. Uh, they've been very, very much, and uh, thankfully for my part, very much willing to um, contribute their thoughts and ideas. Good to hear that. And then my last question, which I know you guys will be so excited when it's gone, how long do you think it will take to get rid of the other fencing and the portable and all the other crap? Uh, the other fencing around the temporary maintenance facility. I'd probably defer to Luke on that question if you don't mind. Um, you know, I don't, uh, Luke, what's your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, well, I mean, as soon as possible, but the, um, the move in process, we'll keep that up during the transition, just because yeah. we're having a lot of equipment in both areas. We'll need to keep uh, both areas, the, the new um, facility and, and the temporary site, secure before we you know, get everything in. And we're going to be yeah. um, installing you know, shelving and some you know, storage uh, situations in the new facility. So there'll be a little bit of a process just to get everything in there in a way that makes sense and is well organized. Um, so we're not going to super rush, but uh, our goal is to have all that down as soon as possible and, and return the park to its um, you know, normal status. All right. I figure I just, I'm excited to see it you know, without both of the fencing's around and everything. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then Lisa, before you go to public comment, I had something I wrote down here um, that I also wanted to mention, um, and I'm not sure how many people have been following this
that's news. <laughs> All right. Um, cool. Well, then, uh, are there, is there any public comment? Uh, yeah, one second. Steven. Yeah, you guys are pretty chatty there. We're talking about a lot of stuff. Um, I, I just want to stick to the district manager report. Um, so, uh, you know, I complimented you on the, the budgeting um, report, um, and I appreciate this report, um, but I do want to point out that we're way behind schedule, and this is a very, very expensive project. It is the most expensive maintenance shed facility in all of Marin County, maybe all of California, and we just have to keep in mind that a lot of money is being spent here, and the, the project is... You know, I don't know what's going on with the contractor, but I'm really kind of surprised that there's not more activity moving along quicker. Um, and I think that is a, as a result of uh, maybe uh, not the best oversight uh, to the project. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. I, I know that's not an area that uh, Eric has experience uh, with, uh, but um, it is kind of frustrating because it is costing us a bunch of money and delays um, that could be used. You know, the money can be used for other stuff. Um, now, as far as the fire recruitment uh, department recruitment needs, um, I do think when we, we run into these issues with recruitment, um, we need to keep in mind that we do currently spend a lot of money for our fire department. And, you know, I'm not saying that people are overpaid necessarily, but I'm saying that uh, we're a very small district and we used to get paid for uh, going on calls uh, in uh, in the other areas for the city of San Rafael. Now we're paying the city of San Rafael. So we're basically, I, the way I look at it, we are subsidizing the city of San Rafael uh, with our fire department. I do think it's worthwhile periodically to reconsider the future of the fire department. I do think that the ultimate uh, goal should be a uh, either a countywide or a regional fire department um, uh, that would allow uh, for efficiencies and uh, deployment of assets appropriately. Um, at the beginning of this, uh, we were talking about, I was talking about the potential of doubling the size of our um, community, and that's going to definitely affect our fire department and our investment. So please keep that in mind. I do have a couple other things that uh, I want to say that, uh, you know, last month uh, I made some comments critical in the first part of the meeting prior to the meeting with the uh, general manager and those comments were never recorded never put down in writing and so they just disappeared into the ether i'm very disappointed with that i expect uh these public meetings should be recorded um and um i you know perhaps it was an oversight but uh i, I think it's important that we have record of what is being said in our meetings not just brief uh vague references to someone spoke and we noted it okay so thank you Stephen. all right any other comments uh no okay moving on to uh chief officer report and activity summary Chief Senate. Yeah, hi, thank you again. Uh, Chief White gave you a very detailed and informative uh, fire department update dated November 8, 2022, report packet. And I certainly don't want to uh, repeat it uh, word for word. I'll just go over some of the high points. Uh, under item number one, the wildfire authority vegetation management, uh, there's an update on evacuation, ingress, and egress a risk assessment project with the goal of constructing an inventory of risk factors and dynamic models of wildland spread, communication processes, and transportation networks that can simulate wildfire evacuation scenarios. So he gave you a very uh, nice overview of that. Uh, secondly, he discusses uh, the COVID 19 guidelines. Um, he does warn that new COVID variants are possible this winter. Uh, however, the number of hospitalizations are not expected to rise, infection shorter in duration, and less severe is the forecast. Uh, the chief has provided a summary of current research and reports for your review on that topic. Uh, item number three was the uh, Burn Foundation Relay fundraising effort. Uh, the Marine Fire Agencies again participated in this very annual uh, work, or this very worthwhile annual fundraising event. Uh, Marine Wood Firefighters were able to generate $600 to donate towards that, and um, the money goes to uh, towards sending uh, burn victims, juvenile burn victims, to a wonderful summer camp. Um, so um, I applaud uh, Marine Wood for their efforts there. Uh, item number four, the recognition event. The chief held a recognition event for the Center for Marine uh, Firefighting Staff. That assisted with a very comprehensive recent 10 week uh, firefighter academy. Uh, Captain John Huffman Nicolau received a certificate of appreciation from the chief, and there's a picture of him. Uh, he was at the ceremony, and we, we really appreciate his efforts and the partnership that, that Marinewood uh, provides for the academy. Now, we talked about the upcoming recruitment, that the chief knows the increasing challenge and competition. That's what it is now. It's competition between agencies. We talked about those sign on bonuses. It's like, you know, we, we can't compete with that. We're, we're really um, we're, we're facing a huge new challenge as we discussed. Um, we talked about the number of uh, candidates receiving paramedic licenses, and the state has dropped. It just doesn't seem to be the interest. One other area of crisis is the private ambulance business. Um, Marine County used to use private ambulance companies exclusively for ambulance transport. The fire department would respond to the emergency along with a private ambulance. The private ambulance would transport the patient to the hospital. Uh, we have since transitioned. It took several years to do it. It was a slow, slow transition, but we transitioned to a fire-based ALS paramedic transport system. Um, but in many other areas, including the Bay Area, uh, private ambulance providers still are the primary transport for patients uh, from 911 emergencies. They cannot hire paramedics. They are facing uh, a crisis. So everybody is, is facing this, this hiring challenge as we discussed a few minutes ago. So um, it's, it's hitting us on multiple fronts. Um, so we hope we hope to see uh, a change in that, you know, in the future. Maybe, maybe the interest will shift back towards public service. But right now it is shifted away from public service. Uh, Chief White provides his analysis of the problems facing uh, the recruitment of firefighter, firefighter paramedics. And as noted, um, Ringwood will have two firefighter paramedic vacancies uh, here shortly, and recruitment will, will get underway in the next few weeks. In Santa Fe, we're looking at uh, possibly going back to an EMT uh, track where we're not requiring paramedics. Um, we'll just require an EMT certificate. And with that, what we can do is we can drop down to the high schools and we start to garner interest at that level. Again, kind of getting back to that homegrown interest, uh, seeing if there are people that, uh, students that would like to learn more about the fire service, starting to get programs. We talked about volunteer programs a few minutes ago. Those are a bit challenging. To be a volunteer firefighter, you need to have the similar training as a professional firefighter. To be, a, to be a responding volunteer firefighter. And people just can't put forth that time and effort any longer. 
that didn't used to be the case. When I started in the fire service as a volunteer, a few hours of training, they gave you a coat and a hat, you were ready to go. Uh, that is no longer the case. A volunteer firefighter needs to be trained to the same level as a professional firefighter before they respond to an emergency. And you just can't find that commitment any longer. Uh, it's, it's just not possible. But we're looking at cadet programs, apprenticeship programs, uh, getting into the high schools, uh, offering EMT um, incentives, people taking EMT courses, we will, we will pay the tuition. We're looking at all sorts of things like that to try and get people more interested in the fire service. So uh, we're, we're trying anything we can, but the paramedic uh, issue is a growing one. And the, the kind of the lack of, of new qualified paramedics across the state uh, is impacting everybody, fire departments, private ambulance companies. Uh, the chief attached the call statistics for the month, which are probably similar to uh, those you see from month to month. I didn't see anything that jumped out um, uh, of concern. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention quickly was I mentioned two challenges a few minutes ago. Uh, one challenge was hiring and recruitment. The second challenge is vehicles right now. Finding vehicles. There is a nationwide ambulance shortage. You can't find new ambulances. Ambulances are, are the vehicles that wear out the fastest because they're on the road the most. They're going to all the calls. They're running people to the hospital back and forth, back and forth. And in San Rafael, our ambulances are all in excess of now 100,000 miles. Uh, they're getting old, they break down. We had an ambulance breakdown with a patient on board on Highway 101 going to um, Marin Health uh, two weeks ago. And there was a crisis where the companies that manufacture ambulances, they're just not being able to produce them right now. We actually placed an order for two ambulances and they said, we'll see you in 2024, possibly, maybe 2025 for your ambulances. Uh, ladder trucks, our ladder truck, which we purchased in 2015, uh, is due for replacement. That ladder truck cost $900,000 in 2015. The same exact vehicle right now costs $2.2 .2 million with a two year minimum uh, wait for delivery. So we're, we're facing challenges on multiple fronts here and uh, just wanted to kind of pass that along. <laughs> is there good news? Uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully the pandemic is winding down and, and we can return to normalcy. Um, masks are becoming you know, less frequently worn. Um, uh, firefighter uh, illness has basically dropped off from COVID related illness. So that's a good thing. So I'll turn it back to you. Is, is it a short supply due to just general? Because like there's supply cars, chain. supply chains? Yeah, I mean, if you drive by the car lots, you don't see any cars on the lots. Yeah. Right? Um, okay. I was wondering if it's the same thing same with the, okay. Because yeah, it's startling. Okay. Yeah, it is. Um, San Francisco Fire Department, they contacted um, all of the ambulance manufacturers recently, and they purchased every demo unit they, they had. Every single demo unit, that the, there's three primary ambulance manufacturers. They just nabbed all of their demo units just because they were so desperate. People are doing things like that. Or agencies are doing things like that. So it's uh, crazy times. Oh, thank you for the... Not so good news. Yeah. Oh, that's a sunny note. Yeah. <laughs> I just, we I'm like just, seeing you. I don't like the words that came out of your mouth, but it was nice seeing you. <laughs> I will tell you though, we rise to the challenge. We, we, you know, we find solutions to the problems. That's what we do. That's the fire department. It, it, we, we serve, we serve our public, and we'll continue to do that. Um, and we'll figure things out. So we're here to help, hopefully. Thank you for that for the report. Um, anyone else have on the board have anything they'd like to ask, or share? All right. Um, anything from the public? I don't see any hands, but I have no hands raised for um, the chief uh, fire chief report. Okay. Chief Senate, thank you very much. Certainly appreciate uh, you joining us tonight and all of your hard work and time uh, spent collaborating and getting the fire code put together for us. Thank you. Until you close, I can see why Chief uh, White said, hey, any chance you can cover for me uh, <laughs> tonight? <laughs> I will tell you that the fire code update process is a marathon event. And three years ago, after I completed it for Center Fell and Greenwood, I said to myself, I want to be retired before the next one. And here I am. Uh, well, we'll see you in three more years, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate it. Thank, thank you. It was great seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. All right. So then um, that brings us to Park and Recreation Matters, item one. The Miller Creek Trail Initiative. Uh, yeah, I can uh, take that. Um, I, I want to lead off that you know this item right now is just really looking at you know a discussion and mostly just kind of looking for direction from the board. There, this is not a formal action at this time. Um, this would become a formal action in the event that we move uh, forward. The formal action would be with the approval of an actual legal agreement. So we're obviously not at that point. I'm not engaging legal to drop an agreement that I don't have all of the terms completely in place for yet. Uh, not to mention some of these terms really just kind of came together uh, in the last uh, week or two. Um, at any rate, uh, without getting too far into the background, I did uh, list the background of how we got to this point. Um, I'm sure the board is aware of that, and it's all printed into the packet. Um, I've had several communications uh, with a uh, group that's known as the, L the Oaks LLC, uh, which are the property owners and the developers of the proposed senior site. Um, they're just looking at to what would be an equitable uh, cost sharing proposal because they do have their uh, requirement written into their subdivision improvement agreement. Um, as you can see, I included a chart here. Uh, you know, one of the things that they proposed is we we're trying to figure this out because the trail that is listed or kind of you know vaguely described in the. Uh, subdivision improvement agreement, obviously, uh, for us, just wasn't an adequate trail to be built put on uh, public lands to be getting the traffic that we anticipate and um, would foresee that as being a heavy intensive job to do uh, with a lot of maintenance needs, most likely in the future. So we um, have, you know, kind of pushed our way more towards a much more robust uh, trail that will stand the test of time be properly built. Um, but with that said, when we we're trying to come up with a cost sharing agreement on this, um, the developers proposed and uh, staff agreed and thought that it seemed fair and reasonable to uh, go back to um, Timothy uh, Best, who is a, a trail design engineer, um, and ask him uh, with his familiarity of the area if he would provide us with an estimate of what it would have cost to build the trail as described in the 2006 original agreement. So that is the chart that you see at the bottom of page one of my report. Um, and working with the contractors, uh, not, I'm sorry, with the developers, uh, the, you know, we kind of both came to the terms that I think uh, are, and I do believe are actually very fair and reasonable. Those terms are bullet pointed in my report, um, but to you know, kind of put it um, uh, out there, uh, they have agreed to a one-time fixed payment amount of $150,000 that would be applied towards the construction of this trail that uh, the district is preferring to build. Um, they would provide that contribution promptly upon completion of the construction of the bridge that extends from Ringwood Avenue uh, that will be leading to the proposed senior living site. Um, in accordance with the 2006 agreement, due to lack of accessibility, trail construction really cannot begin until the aforementioned bridge has been completed anyway. Uh, if the bridge extending from Marinwood Avenue leading to the proposed senior living site is not constructed and accessible uh, for this use by July 31st, 2024, the district would reserve the right to go back and acquire an updated costing on that. Um, one of the things that we looked at in coming up with that date, they actually wanted a slightly um, 
or the route lead date when it's settled on this date. They are really hoping that this bridge is actually done within this next building year um, for this type of project, which would be uh, essentially April through October of 2023, um, which would be fantastic. But much of that is also out of their control, just as we have experienced here. Um, they currently have had plans sitting for months at the county waiting for approvals, at least that is um, what they have informed. Uh, but they're really hoping that uh, now that they know they're not going to work on it until next April, uh, that they can get those things in line. I thought 731.24 uh, was a fair date, especially since we settled on a cost that actually is more than the uh, construction cost of the other trail. Um, I feel that, that, again, is fair and reasonable and not an unreasonable term. Uh, if it stretches out beyond that, we can always take it back and take a look at this. Um, what that would do at the point that they make this payment would basically relieve them of all responsibility for the trail. The district would take on all project management aspects. We would have the sole right to determine final trail placement, design, construction concepts, selection uh, process of the qualified bidder, which uh, is kind of spelled out anyway through the public works laws. Um, and again, we would be responsible for all the required biological and cultural studies, sequel compliance, permitting, public engagement, um, and would ultimately assume all project costs incurred above and beyond uh, their contribution. Again, I do feel that this is a fair and reasonable agreement for both parties. My recommendation would be that the board uh, generally accept the proposed terms as presented and direct staff to engage district legal counsel to go ahead and finalize a draft binding legal agreement, which would include all of the presented terms and conditions, as well as all the other legal language that they would feel is necessary for such an agreement. Questions? I'll start. Okay. Um, you have a dollar amount here of two seven two hundred seventy four thousand. Is that the original one that we decided that we would go with? Yes. Does that include all the reports and all the research and everything that we have to include? No. So do you have an estimated amount of what this whole project as a whole would cost? Um, I would be a little hesitant to give you an estimated amount on that, but I would say you'd probably be looking just for the biological, the cultural, um, those studies would fall somewhere between seven and 10, I think would be my safe estimate at this point in time, thousand. Uh, and that's kind of based on, you know, we had to go through all of these same and similar studies when we did the construction project for the maintenance facility. Um, and I think that that would fall in line. Uh, and then of course, depending on what comes out of that, um, you could be something that is as simple as what's known as a notice of exemption, meaning that they found no significant impacts. Um, so you don't ha have to then kind of go through what's known as an initial study and then followed by a mitigated negative declaration. Um, you know, some pretty trained eyes have been through that area and know exactly where this placement is and have, uh, uh, you know, unofficially feel fairly optimistic that that would be the case that we'd be able to kind of go through that they wouldn't find, you know, special species or, uh, you know, wildlife impacts or things along those lines. Cultural, you never really know. I mean, we have a, a uh, this region was, you know, heavily populated uh, from a cultural resources, you know, perspective back in the day, but um, it would kind of go through those studies. But to be also very clear, we put this agreement in place at that point. Uh, you know, I would come back, I would go out, look at some, uh, get some firm cost estimates. Uh, and then by the time you have this agreement in front of you, have those, uh, you know, kind of cost quotes from the various agencies that do that kind of work, and then kind of get the go, no go to, yes, let's move forward with that level of investment um, at the seven to $10,000 range. And then you're going to have a real true feeling of the feasibility to put the study together from a construction standpoint. We've already done that part. And now we'd be looking at this from an environmental um, and cultural standpoint. So hypothetically, let's yes. say it's 15, right? Or let's say 25. So let's say it's around 300,000. So then that would mean our share would be 150,000. Is our goal to get grants and other funding from different places for that? Or is that expected to be coming out of our budget? Uh, it probably could be a mix of both. I don't know that I would call it our goal. I, I think, you know, a lot of the times when you go for funding for this type of a project, you're looking at, you know, generally state level funding. Um, and those come with a lot of requirements, a lot of work, a lot, you know, property deeding, things along those lines. I, it's not for us. Yes, it's a large investment, but uh, it's not a grant of that nature can easily climb into the seven figures. Um, so for the work that's involved and the maintenance and, and what is expected from those grants, it, it honestly might not be worth it to chase the grants. That said, we will certainly keep an eye out for funding that could be available and, and look to the feasibility of applying for the funding. Um, but as somebody who, you know, managed nonprofit organizations for years, I can tell you sometimes that, um, you know, to give you a, a cliche, that the juice isn't worth the squeeze. So paperwork it, is overwhelming. It, it, well, it's paperwork. not just the paperwork. It's also the requirements that come with that funding um, that extend beyond your know, paperwork is one thing. Paperwork can be done, um, but it's just other requirements that can often come with funding of that nature too. Okay. But yes, they will be explored. How about that? <laughs> I'll just say it. I'm a little on the fence with it to see if this is that where me as just one individual of this board would want to spend 150,000 estimated 150,000. Okay. Um, I think I've got <laughs> one, maybe, maybe two things. Uh, number one, I think this is just to answer your, your on the fence, Kathleen. Um, I think we're a long way from deciding whether we're doing this or not. Um, I think we're just still in that conceptual place um, because we have to bring in a, a lot of public input, especially those people who are most directly affected who this is going to, you know, be within the feet of their property. Um, but before we even walk that road, I, I'm a little, the thing that jumps out at me and, and Eric, I, I totally understand why you were bargaining with, with this. The July 31st, 2024 is a concern for me because when we're looking at rates of inflation now, um, and, and our park maintenance facility certainly fell prey to this, you know, not anybody's fault, but it's just the, the world and, and world economics that my concern is that if we go another, you know, basically uh, two building seasons, um, the, you know, at the rate of inflation, we, we could be pricing ourselves out of this, that, that a, you know, $278,000 trail could, could grow really quickly. Um, so I'd be interested in changing that date to the end of the next building season. Um, I think you mentioned October. I'm not sure if that's accurate, but I, I think you were saying the building season is like April to October. So I'd like to say something like October of 2023, whatever the appropriate date would be. Then if they don't get it in by then and we don't have access by then, then we'd have to go back and evaluate, you know, what are what are the inflationary factors to to raise that 150,000? Or maybe the reality is, is 150,000 is, is a, you know, we could argue that's 50% of this project, um, that they would be in for 50% of the project um, when we get access to that based on their bridge building. Um, and then, you know, that, that could be, an, I guess that's another way to approach it is what I'm thinking. Could be, I think that, uh their concern and again i'm not going to speak for the developers here other than okay. to tell you what our thing was um you know a, i guess let me lead off by two things in, in comparing you know kind of the two projects um the maintenance facility was also very material heavy yes. this isn't a, a, not a lot of material involved you're looking you know kind of primarily at labor um in, in the construction of this project <clears throat> which yes labor does go up it'd be subject to you know public works prevailing wage things along those lines which is also again why um you know coming in i thought at 115 above because originally they wanted to say okay well here's at the 135 uh, and then recognizing that we're going to be kind of taking over some of that other stuff does cover some of those other expenses that are in there as well um but i, I don't uh 
I understand your concern, Chris, and looking at this from 731.24, I also understood what it was exactly that they were moving through and trying to get accomplished in all the regulatory agencies that they've been working with, not only at the county, but every other agency and getting their plans in. They had really hope to be able to get it in this season. I think the expectation is still hopefully to get it in by next season. And if you look at July 31, 2024, the reason we kind of settled on that date was if for some reason it does get pushed to 2024, then they have the very beginning of the building season to get that done. So that way we can kind of get it done by the end. Um, I'm happy to go back to them with a different date. I, I, I'm happy to go back to them with a different date, but uh, just through a lot of conversations, I will say that I think we settled on, you know, kind of came to this term along with the 150,000 term, uh, which I was pretty happy about both, especially on the 150,000 side to be contributed towards this project that we may or may not do. Their right. hesitation was just simply because so many factors are also out of their control in being able to move forward. And I think both parties just want to kind of resolve this part of this project. And I totally, number one, I appreciate, I, I know you worked hard on, on bringing this together. Um, I guess for me, I'm trying to protect the people of Marinwood and their tax dollars in, in saying that, uh, you know, whether, whether we do this or not is a whole separate issue. Um, but um, if we did, I'd like to protect us from having to reach deeper into our pockets to do so because this has been a longstanding agreement. Um, and to me, okay, let's, let's say it goes up $10,000 more for them. Um, I think that's something that they owe us given um, the nature of the agreement, as opposed to us having to dive deeper in our pockets. And potentially maybe that determines whether we even do the project or not, right? And I hate to have it come down to that when this company really needs us to be able to, to do that project if I understand the agreement from earlier. Well, and to be clear, they weren't the original owners or proposers of this entire project. You know, they kind of actually wound up buying the property and the rights to develop it with this approved and in looking at what this was on old 2006 agreement that says, oh yeah, you got to put a trail in here, uh, which, you know, as we've heard kind of in past comments of, uh, oh yeah, just get a couple guys on a shovel and you can build a trail. And we're saying, yeah, it's not quite that way. And that's not the type of trail we would be putting on our, on our lands, um, even at the rudimentally described trail that is in, uh, in the language of this agreement. Um, with the placement of it, with the width of it, with the way that it would have to be designed, I think we're trying to steer this ship a little bit uh, in terms of having a, a much more higher quality project product um, that will last for a long time and be extremely well built. Um, so, you know, again, I understand our, our role is to look up to the district, but I, I can also see, understand their perspective and how they're looking at this as well and, and what they kind of take it on and the thing is, you know, really kind of take it on a life of its own. So, yeah, to totally get from both sides um, uh, because I don't represent them. Right. Um, I represent the people in Marinwood. I My two cents would be to ask them to change that date to, again, I'm, I'm not sure the exact appropriate end of season for 2023, but it would be the end of their building season 2023 which I, I'm only trying to search the, the recesses of my feeble brain. And I think you've mentioned October before. Yeah, that was like the start of the rainy season. All right. Like that's that's just my opinion. Obviously, yeah. other people on the board may have a different opinion. I can be uh, outvoted on this. Well, I don't think we're going to a vote tonight. But um, but I think, I think it, well, is there anything that you would like to add or any questions? I mean, we all want the best for our, our district. My only concern is if we go back too many times, they'll just say, you know what, we're just going to not even give you any other extra money. We're just going by the original. Um, and if there's maybe a possibility of saying, maybe not changing the date per se, but giving an amendum that between X date and X date, like, Chris's date and the date that we have, like if interest rates jump during that time, then it goes, you know, like I realize it makes it even more complicated, but then it gives them their date that they gave us and just saying, hey, but if there's interest rates that go up like 10%, randomly putting out a number, that we'll get 10% more, right? So we're not changing it per, per se, but we're just saying just in case, we're letting them know that we're worried about interest rates, right? That, right, Chris, would that work for you? Like having like a little amendment about like the interest rates between these two dates? Like, I, I don't think, know. I, I think, think it's more complicated. I don't know. Our legal team would be putting They would do that. Yeah, they would do that. But like, I, I hear everybody, I just feel like if we're going to be putting in more housing, we need to have paths because paths will be made, period. Um, yes, it's $150,000 is a lot of money, but doing it properly and clearly there are funding sources out there, you may not have to dip into our own pocket. And if it does end up being a greater amount that the trail is going to cost, then it makes it even more feasible for us to go to these funding sources because, you know, doing those extra things that they're going to ask us to do will make more sense because it will be more. I don't know. Um, I, I'm very happy with the back and forth that Eric's done so far. Um, it's a hard thing. And with so many balls up in the air that nobody can foresee which way is going, it's very hard to make a decision on which way to make the agreement. But I, I actually think it's a pretty fair agreement. So, but I am not a trained person with the trail, so I have no idea. Um, can I, before you kind of go, John Campo is on this meeting. He is on our PNR commission. Um, he's also um, a senior resource planner for the Marin County Open Space District and actually building trails and doing this is what he does as a professional. And he's incredibly good at and experienced. Do you mind if I bring him on to speak, Lisa? Go right ahead. Thank you. John, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, John. Hey, how's it going? Good, thank you. I appreciate you being able to attend. I was wondering if you might want to uh, lend some voice to some of this based on your professional experience, not only that, but as a PNR commissioner and a, a, a member here. Yeah, no, thanks for that opportunity. Um, so I've been working with Eric and Tim on this from the beginning. Um, you know, I think I've expressed my feelings on this project. I, I think it's extremely valuable for the community. Um, I think it's the location and with the future development, not only of the housing, but of likely the market area and how that will develop in the next decade or, or more. Um, this, this will be a very popular pathway. It will be popular for for people, dog walkers, um, people walking the market, but I think probably most importantly, um, school kids getting from the um, the Casa Marinwood townhomes to the middle school. Um, this will be this will be the obvious path for them to go to school. Um, and so I think, and also Savannah made a really good point that once all those new houses are built, um, this path will likely get used whether we build something or not. Um, if we don't take action to build something sustainable and build it well, it will likely become a liability for the district. So I'm, I'm very much in favor of it. Um, you know, I, I, like Eric said, I do this for a living. I see how it changes people and how, how much they appreciate trails, especially during COVID. Um, the Ponte Trail in Marinwood you know, it was a really big benefit during COVID when people were trapped indoors. And so, again, I think more trails like this in our community, it was just a huge benefit. John, are you able to speak at all to uh, just what you have seen in terms of trail construction cost trends over the last few years? I mean, you, you did talk about um, in this particular project, we're looking at buying rock. So we'll buy rock um, and, we'll buy, and we'll buy labor, um, which there'll be equipment rentals, but there won't be other materials. So um, costs go up. But I mean, I've done this call for a while. I listened to the fire department and others about you know, difficulty hiring people. So it's all, it's consistent. It's costs are rising consistently. The trail building is no different. And I would say that's my exact concern um, is we
I don't, I don't have really strong opinions about the negotiations with the developer. I mean, looking at Eric, um, you know, I, I saw the document that Eric provided and it seems reasonable to me, 150,000 was actually more than I thought we would get. Um, so I'm actually happy with that number, but if, if the dates and whatnot need to be tweaked, I mean, I, certainly that, if that negotiation is available, then that makes sense too. I'm not sure, Eric, if you had other questions for me or. Uh, no, I just, I appreciate your voice on this again. I, you know, just recognizing you have you know, many years of a very successful experience doing projects uh, like this. Uh, the, yeah, uh, I mean, I, I do got to mention, I was at the Board of Supervisors today presenting on a project behind the Carolina High School that just got approved. So that was four years in planning. And so we got that approval and we'll start constructing that later this spring. So that's super exciting. Um, and it's again, really important for the school kids to, to have access to the cross country team, the mountain biking team, et cetera. So. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. Much appreciated. All right. Thank, thank you, John. So what I am taking from this is, you know, really kind of going back to the developers and, you know, essentially putting a, uh, uh, you know, right to revise date as of, you know, just even, you might as well just say 1231, uh, 23 doesn't really matter. Um, you know, as opposed to October, if it's not done in October, the 1231 doesn't, doesn't change that materially in any way, shape, or form. It always looks nicer on a piece of paper. Uh, that, hey, I want to really be clear and point out that's my opinion, but there are three other board members here. Um, you know, it's not like I'm going to go home and cry while well, I'm already home, but I'm not going to cry if they outvote me. I'm just expressing my opinion on this one. Sure. I mean, I don't, I don't know that I see the harm in making a, a request for that type of an amendment to see if that's something that would be feasible. Uh, no, I, I, to be clear, uh, that's where I started. And their numbers also started lower, and we got to this 150 with pushing that date out a little bit. I, I'm happy to go back to them with it if we want to engage in a much more formal level of uh, negotiation with them. I, I would assume we can do that as well. Um, but you know, 12, that was always you know kind of the date that I had. had. They also came in with a lower number, and I said, look, if we can push this number up higher, then I would be willing to take it to the board at that date. You know, and, and they actually wanted 1231 24. Um, so that was when we moved it to 731, which would give them time to complete construction at the start of that cycle uh, that season. Right. So you know, I, I guess my the only thing I want to reiterate is I wouldn't be willing to go down in number in order to change the date. Let me just put it that way. We can also go 160 and keep their date. <laughs> We're negotiating with ourselves at this point. But I just wanted to say, like, I, I personally wouldn't want to give up money in order to get an earlier date. I agree. Right. I don't think any of us do. But yeah, no, I mean, that, yeah, I think that that's, that piece is clear. So if it were, you know, um, I think having that um, the dialogue, I think will, will, will be helpful and we can kind of see where, where we can go from there. Well, I will let them know that, uh, that we need to move it to 1231 and just kind of have to go from there. I, I will say, I mean, they've been, it's been a very collaborative process. I, I appreciate the way that they've been communicating with us. Like I said, they could have made this very difficult. There's new people who kind of came on and said, look, the agreement just calls for this, so we're just going to build this trail and we're going to wipe our hands from this um, and recognize that, that, you know, we're trying to do something bigger and better um, than what the agreement calls for. And they've been willing to work with us on that. So, you know, I, I do appreciate the levels of communications that they've had. Better marketing for their houses. You blame on me. Well, they're building a senior living center and a memory care unit, so I'm, I'm not sure they're going to use the trail. <laughs> the trail is marketing for it, Savon, but uh, okay. <laughs> Maybe they won't mention it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, you want public comment, Lisa? Yeah. yeah. Steven. Yeah, hi, I just want to remind people that it doesn't matter where the money comes from as long as we get the money. And I think there's lots of time to explore uh, different grant proposals. Um, for example, uh, accessibility, uh, uh, bike trails. I, I don't even know what's out there, but I know this is the kind of thing that uh, if you pitch it right, you get money. And um, so I would recommend that we just don't fixate on the Oaks developers, but think in terms of where else we can get some funds. The other thing I want to say about this is um, I think there should be a vision for this particular trail. One of my concerns is that it would turn into a bike only trail and it'd be dangerous for people to, to walk. Um, so, uh, you know, that's something that the, the board needs to discuss, um, but I'm sure you can come up with something. Um, there is a problem, I think, in Marinwood uh, Park with uh, speeding bicycles. It doesn't happen too often, but especially with these electric bikes. I was walking the other day and someone had like, basically it looked like an electric motorcycle. Uh, he was wearing a full face helmet and it looked like a motorcycle. And it did have pedals, but uh, it was a very powerful bike, I could tell. And uh, you really, you can really do some damage to uh, some, some walker if, if you're going too fast. So, so I guess two things. There's plenty of money out there. But we also need to think in terms of how this uh, trail is going to serve our public. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Okay, uh, I think I have it put together here on uh, where the board is headed collectively at. So uh, this will come back to you again at a future meeting, maybe even just in the form of an actual legal agreement. All right, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, then moving on to the recreation and park maintenance activity reports. Thanks, Lisa. Hello, um, everyone. I'll just touch on a few uh, points in, in the report, try to keep this fairly brief, but um, uh, just one thing that, that uh, on the recreation side, it's kind of a new phenomenon. We um, partnered with the Lions Club a couple weeks ago to run a vision clinic for our preschool program, which was really neat. Um, it was really uh, fun, fun thing to, to watch the little preschoolers doing the, the different eye tests. We had a couple different stations set up. And, um, and it was deemed a successful clinic and that a few anom anomalies were undetected. Um, and so um, we recommended additional screening for, for those individuals. Um, and we've got some future clinics and other activities planned with the Lions Club. So that was a neat thing that we'll, we'll continue to do in the future. Um, we've got a lot of events, uh, or we had a couple events this fall, and we've got um, a couple more coming up. The Halloween Harvest Festival, which was um, about to happen last time we met, um, was um, a really uh, wonderful event. It was on Friday, October 14th. And uh, we did it out in the park. It was a carnival style event with a lot of carnival games. We had a pumpkin patch, um, and there were some arts and crafts and, and uh, some treats. And it was a really, really fun event. I think it was our, our largest attendance we've ever had at the Halloween Harvest Festival. We had over 400 people come, and I'm glad that we spread out uh, after last year. We, we were able to um, accommodate the crowds and, and the lines, and everyone seemed to have a really good time. Almost everybody was in costume. And, and that was great. And a uh, big thanks to the Les Mize who represented the Lions and served popcorn all night. I think he had the most uh, popular station and he was on his feet just hanging off popcorn nonstop. Um, and I uh, really appreciate him. And then we had a, a whole crew of, of uh, summer camp counselors and lifeguard staff and different staff helping us uh, man the games and helping us set up and clean up. So it was a really nice event and a really um, grateful all the help we had from, from our staff and the Lions. So um, 
the next week, or, yeah, about a week later, we had our fall art show, um, which was a huge uh, success, uh, another nice event. I think that one also had our best turnout for the art show that we've seen. And so that event has continued to grow in popularity uh, since we started it um, a bunch of years ago. I think this was our 11th. I got a dispute with Susan, who helps us run this. She thinks it's our 12th. But, um, so it was our 11th or 12th uh, in person art show that we've had. Um, and it was a really nice show, really nice event. And uh, we look forward to we'll another one coming up in the spring. So um, the next event we plan is our, our uh, wintertime event. We are doing a, uh, another kind of a repeat of last year's outdoor Christmas concert or holiday concert event. And um, uh, weather permitting, we'll, we'll do another one of those. We'll have photos with Santa. We'll have a lot of um, we'll arts and crafts for kids. We'll have uh, hot refreshments and um, some heat lamps and things. But um, if uh, the weather allows, we'll have another concert. We'll move it inside and do a plan B if um, it's raining on us. But we're uh, making a lot of plans for that. And that should be a really nice event again this year. So staff are hard at work getting that all um, figured out and planned. Uh, and then uh, other programs are going really well. Uh, we have a winter break camp coming up during the winter holiday um, school break. And that's currently full, which, which we're excited about. And we have um, uh, a couple other programs that are, that are full. We've had to add some days and times that we're excited about. So uh, things are busy here at the community center for the rec staff. Um, we continue to recruit for our recreation supervisor position. And uh, that uh, application process um, is, is scheduled to close this week. And we'll, and we'll see if we have enough applicants to, to you know, move forward. That might extend the deadline. But um, after listening to Chief uh, Sinnott's comments about staffing, I just wanted to kind of echo that. With uh, We've been experiencing that on the recreation side. I know Eric mentioned it. But um, uh, applications have uh, dwindled in, in over the you know, recent years for lifeguards, summer camp counselors, preschool teachers, after school counselors. So it's definitely something we're seeing across uh, many different aspects of our community center and our operations. And um, and so that's uh, it is tricky. And we're trying to hire a recreation supervisor right now. And I think there's three or four other agencies in Marin offering you know hiring the same position. And so it's, it's definitely competitive and it's tricky. So I feel the fire department's uh, challenge with that, and we're, we're trying to um, soldier through that. So I'll keep the, the board updated as we um, you know, figure that out, and, and hopefully we get a good candidate here soon. So I'll let you guys know. Um, but on the parks maintenance side, um, we're really thrilled that our staff is once again made whole uh, with the return of Esteban after being out for um, a little while, uh, having his uh, enjoying the welcome of his new baby, uh, Cameron, to the world. So um, we're really excited and, and happy for their, their growing family um, and happy to have him back uh, on the staff after being gone for a little while. So um, that's been, it's been great to have him back and hearing all about uh, you know life at home and uh, hearing how much sleep he's getting each night. Um, the staff have been working hard this with the rain coming this week. We have been focusing a lot on making sure that uh, things are um, in good shape to accommodate the water that we're getting. So we've been out checking the drains and the culverts and the V ditches throughout the community. We've got a pretty extensive network of drainage in the open space uh, behind the houses that we monitor throughout the rainy season uh, to make sure things are flowing and, and that everything's clear and we're not seeing any flooding. So um, upon our initial inspection things look pretty good and are um, ready for the rain but we'll keep an eye on uh, areas that uh, historically have uh, issues with, with flooding or clogging and we'll address those as needed. Um, we've been out in the creek a little bit last week and this week uh, walking along the creek just checking for uh, hazards there and also um, identifying areas that we'll um, address for, for erosion abatement um, this, this December uh, will be have a good uh, it's a good season for doing a lot of plantings. So um, I was out today with um, Sarah Phillips who uh, works with the she's the urban streams program manager for the Marine Resource Conservation District um, who volunteers volunteer time several times to come out and give us guidance on um, how to address uh, the creek and where to do plantings and um, you know, what to do when we've got trees that fall down which ones to, to uh, cut and remove which ones to leave in place. So really grateful to have some expertise helping us make decisions about how best to um, approach the creek and to keep everything in um, good shape when, when the water starts flowing. So we're happy to have the rain and uh, we're just making sure that uh, everything will be able to handle it. Um, in addition to that, the staff has been doing a lot of uh, maintenance at the pool. Now that um, the pool's closed for the off season, we've been getting uh, the bathrooms uh, repainted, making some much needed repairs and, um, and then also getting some of the equipment winterized uh, for the cold and, and um, the way. So we're making prepared preparations for the next season while also um, kind of keeping things, uh, getting things all covered up um, for, the, for the rainy winter that we're hoping to have. Um, and that's been going great. Uh, and so uh, yeah, I think that's all I wanted to cover. Um, let me know if anyone has any uh, questions or would like me to go any um, more in depth on any of that. Thank you. Thanks, Luke. One question, Luke. I don't know. Uh, it sounds like you guys have been super busy. Um, do you guys have a timeline? I think we're going to start looking at restrooms or possible restroom solutions. Um, yeah, so that uh, we have had some, some conversations that have looked at some of the options with that. Um, at this point, I think our next step is we are um, wanting to bring in um, an engineer that can kind of let us know what the options are in terms of tying into existing utilities and sewer lines. Uh, we've not uh, had, had someone come out and, and look at the site yet for that. We've got a few different locations we've been um, thinking about for that and, and identifying those so that we can have someone give us um, an assessment and let us know what the best options are. So we have a talk on a staffing level about that, uh, but that is, that's where we're at. And we'll hopefully have some more information to, to bring to the commission um, in the next month or, or so uh, with you know, kind of where we're at. Perfect. Can I jump into, I, you know, uh... I understand that we want to bring something there, but you know, I, I think I just feel like I have to speak up. That we right now also still have a lot of things happening. We're trying to get this maintenance facility done, and we're trying to get that done. And you know, Luke's been down a staff person, and uh, it's amazing how much we accomplish with how few people we have anyway. Uh, and, and I just, I understand we, that's something we want to explore. But to be, you know, unless the board really wants to say, hey, we don't want you to work on something else, so you can focus on that. That that's not at the very top of the list. Um, that said, we're not neglecting it, uh, and we're certainly going to look into it. And as Luke just mentioned, you know, when you start looking at engineers, there's costs associated with that. So we're gonna, you know, have a civil engineer come out to lay out something for us, or even just to give us his advice. You're, you're paying their their market rates to get that. It's not. It, it just uh, it hasn't fallen off of our radar by any stretch. And Luke and I certainly do talk about it quite a bit, but uh, we just need a little bit. Of time here to really be able to make some headway on that you know some of the areas we're actually thinking about where something like that might make the most sense is covered in a temporary maintenance facility right now so it's uh you know i just i guess what i'm saying is i'm asking for a little patience to let us get through some of these large things that we're right near the finish line on before we even start contemplating what i promise you would turn into another large project i'm um, simply you know pouring a slab and slapping something down and calling it done is not what this project is going to be no matter how it's been presented um there's gonna be a lot more to it and to Luke's point it is going to involve engineering and civils and it's just something that you want to tie in if this isn't something that ties into the sewer well then that opens up a whole other ball of wax of it's still something that's going to need to come out and be serviced and flushed and uh, and and you know just in the same way that a, a portable uh, uh, restroom is um you know so you know there would be other service fees incurred with that so it's important to us um, we've actually have had a lot of talks about it, but I just want to ask a, for a little bit of a leeway for us to be able to make any real progress on it so we can get a few of these other big things just done before we
and he's going to go back to the commission with a suggestion about maybe um, uh, a trial and see how they feel about that. And then, of course, based on their recommendation, we would get something after their next commission meeting, I believe. Which is later this month. So it right. sounds like we have an agenda item there. Perfect timing, yeah. Good, good, good. I'll make sure that the board liaison can attend that one as well. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. <laughs> that's, my, that's my board. Uh, all right. No, yeah, I, 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 I wasn't trying to get a snap. I was just no, saying, no, no, it's, it's totally like, fine. give us some breathing space. Uh, hey, you guys are doing a lot of stuff, and there's a lot more on the horizon for sure. It's not nearly as simple as it sounds. Oh, just throw this building down here in your bathroom solution for the park just taken care of by adding a new bathroom. Yeah, no, it does not sound simple at all, believe me. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, well then I don't really want to bring up my question, Chris. Um, can you add in your future, maybe even January after the first of the year, after you guys move into your maintenance facility, um, the tennis ball, the tennis courts, and possibly just the how much it would cost to either redo it or what our next plan is to address the cracks and other stuff that the community has brought up. Um, yeah, Kathleen, just um, actually I have uh, put a call out to um, one of our contractors that we've used in the past uh, to get updated um, pricing or quotes on uh, some of the options for all of our various tennis courts in the, the states they're in. So um, I, I talked to him back when he was out doing work last time, um, but I know, you know after we've been talking tonight about how prices keep, or costs keep changing with, um, with inflation and everything. So uh, we actually are in talks about that and I'm um, kind of on the schedule for some measure of, uh, of repair in the, um, the next season for that. So um, whether that's probably some repairs this spring, minor repairs, um, and then maybe a, a bigger project uh, in the next fiscal year. So um, that's something our radar and work on towards that. Okay. Per again, no pressure. I'm taking Okay, thanks. And welcome back, Esty. Right. Anyone else on the board? Any comments, questions, requests? No. All right. I have to talk. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, how about public? Sure, one second. Steven. Uh, yeah, so first address uh, the uh, activity report. Um, I'm glad that we're, we're having fantastic events. Um, I did express concerns, as you recall, last month about the expense of uh, the one and a half hour event. Uh, of course, it didn't deter at least 400 people, I guess, and that's a good thing. But um, I do think if it is successful, that maybe we shouldn't be underwriting you know, all the costs for the event, but uh, run it more like a carnival where individual vendors would uh, pay us for participation. Um, also, I would love to see like a Halloween parade and, and maybe floats and that sort of thing. Halloween's big in our neighborhoods and uh, it's just a fantastic time of the year, I think. And um, I, I, the, the other thing is, you know, how do we define success? Well, we can define success in a couple different ways. One is, you know, how much money did we make? Um, but the other is how many people uh, did we get to attend our events? And um, I would like, particularly this event, the Halloween event, to be a bigger event um, where we have wider participation. I do think actually, we could make money um, and not uh, bear the risk uh, for all the expenses. Uh, the way that this was priced really didn't make sense to me because it was a short event and you had a lot of things going on, a lot of a lot of labor cost. And um, if it was put on uh, vendors, then we wouldn't have that financial risk. Um, down to the maintenance facility, um, it sounds like uh, from, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the maintenance facility, uh, uh, the, the bathroom facility, it sounds like uh, from what Eric is saying that this would be a very, this is a very challenging project for him and the way that he's describing it, I've heard it described in different ways. He seems to want to make things very complicated and expensive. And I got to tell you, I think uh, we are better served by someone who is pragmatic and understands the ins and outs of uh, business and um, construction costs and can really give, um, you know, guide these projects that make sense for our community. I don't know why things have to be so utterly expensive. It's not an excuse that it's a government project. It's just bad management i'm sorry uh, of the project i don't mean to condemn him in every area but in this particular area he's it's lacks experience okay thank you Stephen. thank you can i say one thing before we move on i actually think that eric is doing a stellar job considering covid increasing prices increasing labor prices increasing healthcare prices and increasing building price prices that we have managed to actually do a great job pretty much retaining staff with the small budget that we have and getting a lot done and i object to Stephen's comments that are berating eric um this is not you can criticize but the constant criticism is just character assassination, I feel like, and I'm just not here for it. We're lucky to have Eric, and I hope that he stays with us, even though he has to sit through uh, being told that he is not able to do things when I actually think he's very capable and has shown um, extreme strengths in all these areas. So sorry, I'm really frustrated right now and the words are not coming out of my mouth, so. Thank you, Savon, I agree. Yep, third, agree. Fourth. I appreciate all that. Thank you. That I, I don't ever doubt that level of support. Um, what I will say is, you know, excuses of this is a government project isn't an excuse. It's actually a set of laws and guidelines that you have to follow uh, when you do government projects. So that's the way it works. But everybody's entitled to their opinion, and that is perfectly acceptable. I see that we have another public comment. Correct. One second, please. Gedge. Yes, can you hear me okay? Gotcha. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, thanks again for letting me uh, speak. I just want to, I know that uh, you know, we just heard Stephen, but I would like to agree with Stephen on something and, you know, his, his point about the, uh, the bathrooms. Um, I just wanted to say that I have a lot of experience in porta potties. I've spent a lot of time there over the years. I work in construction and I, you know, there, there's lots of stuff to read inside there sometimes. And um, I think that would be a good idea. I know Eric, you mentioned that it's a long-term project to, to think about uh, getting bathrooms put over there, but I think there's a nice line, kind of an available area over behind the fence on the, uh, like kind of near the quietwood area over by the horseshoe pits. We could kind of line maybe like three or four porta potties up over there for like a year or two while we're kind of figuring out what the permanent solution is. Um, but I think that would be a good solution to the, uh, the porta potty or the bathroom issue uh, that I know has been raised. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry I missed the, uh, the Halloween party. Uh, it sounded like an awesome event, but um, I'll be sure to go next year and looking forward to uh, porta potties over in that part of the, uh, the park. So that's all I have. Uh, thank you very much and really enjoy the meetings and look forward to uh, contributing again in the future. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Gadget. Appreciate your contribution and hope you will keep coming back to our meetings. Um, 
All right, I like the idea too. I'm sure we can look at potentially down the road. So anyway, anything else? I don't see any other public comments. Um, board member items of interest, request for future agenda items. I guess just updates on everything that we've just talked about, right? Um, and then um, next month is going to be Fair Who's president, so that should be on the agenda next month. Are you saying something, Kathleen? You're muted. It, it should be Chris. <laughs> who's behind, who's underneath you? Lisa's doing a great job. She's directly below me. <laughs> she's directly below you. <laughs> Alice. Alice I'm going like this because he's on my, on my screen. Well, pretty soon we'll be in person in March, so we'll be able to or March. Yeah, we'll be able to point in the room. Great. We sure will. Awesome. Um, all right. Well, more more to come, I suppose, on that next month. Um, all right. Well, I think I think if there's nothing else, um, I say we move to adjourn. I'll second that. Lisa, do you want to take public comment on request for future agenda items? Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Yes, public comment, future agenda items. Sorry, Stephen. Stephen. Yes, uh, Eric, thank you very much for uh, reminding Lisa on that. Um, I, I know everyone's doing their best, but uh, sometimes these things get forgotten. Uh, I'm qualified to do something, so you got it. You are qualified to do things. And I, I really, it, it does bother me that um, I can't comment on some areas that I think need improvement and, um, uh, and, and also compliment you on others. I mean, we all have skills and areas of strength. Um, it's kind of frustrating to me that uh, in commenting on my comment, I was uh, personally attacked, which is really, I think, very unfair. And I would appreciate at these meetings if we could uh, follow the rules of decorum. Um, and I'm, happy, I'm just as happy to follow them myself. And I don't mind if things being pointed out to me if I uh, fall astray. As far as the future agenda items, you know, um, I want to report, I contact, I attempted to contact every individual board member uh, this month and I uh, got the following response. Lisa called me right back and we had a very nice conversation. I had a nice conversation with Kathleen as well uh, on the front lawn and um, I, I thought it was very helpful. Um, I contacted Chris. Chris uh, wrote back to me that he didn't think he needed to talk to me because my concerns were going to be addressed. Well, I guess, you know, he reads my mind or something, but we never did get, get that conversation. I've had other conversations with Chris and I, I, I hope this was just a temporary oversight. Bill, uh, Shay did contact me uh, one time, but then did not contact me. The, uh, it's kind of frustrating to talk to Bill outside of the meeting. And um, you know, the, the problem with what I'd like you guys to discuss is how to interact with the 6,000 people that you represent. None of you were elected, you were all appointed. And it's kind of frustrating. I suppose I should have run for office so you'd have to talk um, uh, to the public. But it is, I, I really think you're overlooking your duty to uh, uh, your office when you ignore the public and you simply use this as your time to do whatever you feel that should be done and not consult with the public or treat us uh, with the respect that we deserve. Um, so anyhow, I don't know what happened to Savant, but I couldn't get through to Savant's uh, telephone number. Um, uh, everybody else, it was it was okay, but you know I think the response could have been a whole lot better. And I'd like you to discuss this at the next meeting, how you can do better outreach for the public. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. All right, then if there are no other public comments, um, I'd like to move to adjourn. I'll second. All right, go ahead, Kathleen. Oh, I was going to second, but then she. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> I unmuted before her. Ah, got it. Until you had the, the second, so. Very good. Perfect. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. See you next month. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks.